just after the chief priests and uh, elders and uh, temple guards, that mob that uh, found Jesus in the garden, just after they had seized him, Luke records what Jesus said. And it's very instructive for us. Uh, Luke chapter 22 and verse 53, listen to this. Jesus said to the group, that had just taken hold of him. Every day I was with you in the temple courts, and you did not lay a hand on me, but this is your hour when darkness reigns. Now, I don't know about you, but at first glance, you may be tempted just to read these words and not give them a whole lot of thought and just kind of carry on into the rest of the text concerning the crucifixion of Christ and his arrest. But really, I think we need to stop here for a couple of minutes and camp out at this text because really Jesus is defining a moment in redemptive history. And did you hear how he defined it? It's your hour. Your hour, he said, here when darkness reigns. Now, I, I think it could be said that Throughout the life of the Lord Jesus, there were two bookends. The one is, and you no doubt have read this many times in Scripture, the one bookend is the statement found in the Word, that is this, that the Scriptures might be fulfilled. The second bookend, also found in the Word, come from the words of Jesus where he would say many times, my time has not yet come. So two bookends, so the scriptures might be fulfilled, and my time has not yet come. Now both these statements taken together remind us that everything Jesus did, every moment of his life, every second, he did in fulfillment of God's sovereign plan and timetable. And I find it very interesting as you work your way, especially through John's gospel, that he picks up on one of these statements, and that is the statement my time has not yet come. And back in John chapter 2 and verse 4, this statement from Jesus appears for the very first time in his gospel. And it, it appears during his very first miracle. And Christ turns to his mother and says to his mother, my time has not yet come. And then that statement appears several other times in John's gospel as you follow the story comes up again in chapter 7, comes up again in chapter 8. But then when you finally arrive at chapter 12, and this is the triumphal entry, entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, the, the beginning of Holy Week, now there's a shift. Now Jesus says dramatically, not my time has not yet come, but now he says my time has come. There's a shift in the timetable. Now he's headed towards Calvary. You know, as I just said, nothing in the life of Christ happened by accident. Everything, the hour of his arrest, his trial, his crucifixion, it was all predetermined, was it not, by the Trinity in eternity past. And Peter reminds us of this truth on the day of Pentecost when he said in Acts chapter 2 and 23, this man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. I love this uh, quote from uh, one commentary, and he picks up on this truth, and he says this. He says, God has arranged all of the preceding centuries, all of the intervolutions of time, all of the events from Genesis 1, 1 up to this moment, has arranged and molded them, has had them converge in such a way that there would be a place for this hour, the hour, in which the sun would be bound. He allowed neither forces above nor forces below to tamper with the clock of history. He directed the battles of the Caesars, the conflict of kings, the migration of peoples, the world wars, the courses of the stars and the sun and the moon, the uh, changes of epochs and the complex movements of all things in the world in such a way that this hour would come and has come. And we see this here in the text. When Jesus said to, the, to this group, look, I've been with you all this time, and you never laid a hand on me, but now 
I'm all yours, is in essence what he says. Before that, he was untouchable because the time clock of his crucifixion hadn't arrived. But now it was there. Now that time had finally come in a redemptive history, and they took hold of Christ. And now the high priests who wanted to kill Jesus could kill Jesus. And now (coughs) the forces of evil that wanted to unleash the force of hell itself upon the Son could now unleash the forces of hell upon the Son as God withdraw his merciful restraint. And on the surface, this whole thing looked as if it was Satan's hour. I mean, remember that since the temptation in Luke chapter 4 and 13, uh, the writer tells us that Satan, since the temptation had failed to derail Jesus, he had been looking for another opportunity, another time, another hour when he could finally seize the sun. Well, that had arrived. It was now here. It was here. And it it looked like he was about to take the sun down as he had intended. It appeared to be his hour. It was the worst hour in human history, bar none. But in fact, it was Christ's hour. In fact, it was the finest hour for the Lord Jesus because this would be the hour of of Christ's absolute victory. And this would be the hour of Satan's absolute defeat. And so the truth of the matter is, as we arrive at this text in Luke chapter 22, we are reminded that what appeared to be the hour for the powers of darkness was in fact God's hour. God was still in charge. God still has his hand on the thermostat. He was still controlling the clock all through the ugliness of the crucifixion. Because it was God the Father who released his own son, did he not, to be crushed by the hands of men. And it was Jesus himself who allowed Satan to unleash his worse upon him as he gave himself for our redemption, fulfilling the age-old promise of Genesis 3 and verse 15. And so really what we have here is a commentary, I think, on John chapter 17, 1 to 5. When Jesus talks about this hour, as he does in John 17, he says this, in his high priestly prayer to his father. He says, Father, the time has come. In other words, the hour that you and I have been long awaiting for and had planned for in eternity past has now fully arrived. And the tense of the verbs here, the time has come, indicate that this anticipated hour had finally arrived and remained Now nothing could change, alter, or postpone this hour from happening in any degree. It was fully set in motion. It would be completed just as God had intended. And so why is this hour such a significant hour in our redemptive history? Well, I believe John 17 tells us. First of all, in the very first verse of that that chapter, There we are told that this hour would be the hour in which the Son would ultimately be glorified by the Father, and the Father would ultimately glorify the Son. And this hour was the hour because this was the hour in which eternal life would be finally secured by Christ for us, and Christ would begin to give it to a gift to those who God had given him. And this would be the hour in which our relationship with the eternal God would finally and fully be reconciled and restored forever. And this would be the hour (coughs) when the long-awaited redeeming work of Christ would be completed finally as it had been predicted. And this would be the hour that frankly anticipated the hour of Christ's glorious resurrection and his ascension and glorification. And this was the hour that that anticipated that the Lord Jesus would be given back his pre-incarnate glory by God the Father, and it would be his eternally. And this was 
the hour that frankly set in motion the exact hour when you came to Christ and you received the Lord Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. And this was the hour that secured the hour that is yet to come for us when we will stand in the very presence of the living Christ and we will behold his glory and we will live in the context of that glory forevermore. This hour secured that exact hour to come. And you see, it's all because the Lord Jesus was willing. He was willing to step into this hour of ultimate triumph and tragedy for us. And so every time you partake of this table as the church of Christ, as those redeemed by the blood of Christ, you are remembering that Calvary was the hour of your redemption and reconciliation. <coughs> Excuse me, that forever changed your eternal destiny. That now calls us as the redeemed of Christ, as Ephesians chapter 5, 15, 16 says, now calls us to redeem our times. Now that hour of Calvary has changed every hour for us into a gospel hour. An hour in which we take hold of every opportunity in order to point them to the living Christ and to fulfill the kingdom of God here on earth. And so what a privilege we have to rejoice in that hour when the Son died for us. Amen. Our provincial government's announcement on Wednesday of this past week about vaccine passports has ramifications that are still trickling down and will no, about, no doubt impact every one of us in different ways. The elders and the pastors of West Highland are aware of this. And some of us have received emails and calls in which different concerns have been expressed to us. And we understand that in times like this, God's people look to their leaders to provide information, instruction, counsel, and direction. So we want to assure you that we have already engaged in some preliminary discussions among ourselves. Furthermore, we are praying constantly about these matters, and very soon we plan to share, excuse me, we plan to share our collective counsel with you. These past 18 months have been difficult for all of us, but during this time, we as a church have experienced God's grace in so many ways, and with his help, we have enjoyed the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So we ask that you will pray for us as we seek to navigate our church through these uncharted waters that we presently face, and that our counsel to you will be helpful and serve to strengthen the bonds that we have and enjoy in Christ. May you know the sufficiency of Christ's grace and the strengthening of your inner being by the power of the Holy Spirit as you seek to know and to do the will of the Father. Amen.